everybody. It's time again for Get on the Grid with Kessie Roberts and a brand new episode. I'm so tickled to be with all of you again for this. And my guest tonight is Linda Bender, Dr. Linda Bender. And she and I would like for you to join with us in aligning with the energies of co-creation so that this show gives you the best information to your highest good and best outcome. Welcome, Linda. It's nice to have you with me. Thank you. Welcome. For those of you who have not yet met Linda, she's a passionate animal advocate and educator. Dr. Linda Bender's love of the natural world began in her childhood backyard. Now, I know a lot of my listeners can really resonate with that. From orphan deer to blue jays permanently bumped from their nest, animals in distress somehow found a way to her loving arms. Her innate rapport with the animals inspired her to earn a doctorate in veterinary medicine. During the 14 years she spent living in England, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, Linda's veterinary work included the rescue, rehabilitation, and protection of wildlife, often in remote areas. Working with zoos in Southeast Asia, she treated animals rescued from the wildlife trafficking trade, yay for you, that trade just needs to go away, and helped reintroduce them back into their natural habitat. Among those given a second chance at life were clouded leopards, tigers, orangutans, and numbers, numerous species of rare birds. Working in a field with rarely encountered wildlife, she helped to develop treatment protocols. A dedicated animal advocate and proactive grassroots champion for animals both domestic and wild, Linda recently completed her first book, Animal Wisdom, uh, Learning from the Spiritual Lives of Animals. And I've got to tell you, I'm reading the book right now. It's awesome. This is being, oh, well, it was released back in June of uh, 2014, but it's out there, so you need to go grab it. Her new book illuminates the undeniable ability for animals to restore our ecological, emotional, and spiritual balance. Linda currently lectures and facilitates animal wisdom workshops worldwide. Being a co-founder of the From the Heart nonprofit organization, profits from her book go to this organization to directly benefit animals, their care, and habitat. Linda, I'm just so thrilled to have you on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. I know that a lot of my listeners just absolutely adore animals, and I love them too, but what you have done with this book is touch on the spirituality of this whole group of creatures that most people don't think of as being spiritual things. And I really, yes. really enjoy how you bring that out. So could you talk to us a little bit about that and just go wherever spirit leads you? Well, certainly, certainly. <laughs> I, that's what I love to do most. And I think what, what has happened in our this particular Western culture that we live in, we have um, deluded ourselves into thinking that the human is the only species that has a consciousness that is alive and the materialist science of uh, you know the mainstream voice in science up until quite recently has said that yes for some unknown reason humans are the only ones who have um, soul have spirit have have um, any kind of self-awareness well we know that this is now true and uh, not true and also in our dogmatic religions, you know, we've claimed dominion over animals, that animals and nature are all here for us to use and abuse. So this is changing. Um, it's changing slowly, but it is changing. And if you consider the word animal, think of this for a moment, the word animal, the root word is anima, and it means soul. And my connection began so very early with animals that in my encounters in early life, I understood being invited in the world of animals that all life is soul. Everything is alive. Animals have lives of meaning and purpose that are aside from the meaning and purpose that we as humans assign them. And so what we need to do is have a rethink of our relationship with animals and nature. And particularly now with the situation we've gotten ourselves into, you know, we need to rethink that relationship because what we do to animals in nature is really what we're doing to ourselves. So if we want to save ourselves, we need to save our animals and our, our environment. I understand that. I can remember uh, 
going to school when I was a child, and they would tell us that uh, one of the things that raises people above animals is that people have the ability to play. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And then you observe the animals, and you said, wait a minute, that's play. <laughs> and all of a sudden, lo and behold, science says, we have just discovered this fantastic thing that animals can play like dolphins and monkeys and great apes. And yes. I'm sitting there as a child thinking, mm-hmm. And the other one was that we use tools. And all of a sudden, right. we behold, animals use tools, too. And so this book has really resonated with me on these these yes, yes. Of- well, and <laughs> it's it's so funny because every every premise that we use to try to prove human superiority has you know <laughs> ends up being false. You know? <laughs> and not only are not only are animals using tools, you know the the meta meta tool use, which is means that they make tools out of they make materials into tools. So they use mm-hmm. tools to make tools. So they're continually. Uh, you know, we're continually noticing, finally, that, my goodness, you know, they have their <laughs> such genius in their own species. And the latest one, this made me roar with laughter, is not too long ago someone came came across and said, oh, my God, recent research has indicated that elephants have shown what is called mirror recognition. And so, in other words, when an elephant looks into a mirror, they have self, they they see themselves, they recognize themselves, they'll put their trunk up and notice this or that about themselves. But what's so interesting is that we use mirror recognition as sort of a precursor or a requisite to uh, the ability to have a spiritual life. And so, wow, we've eliminated even that. Yeah. So... I laugh and say, oh, my, yes, slowly and, but surely humans are beginning to come around to the fact that um, animals have a spiritual life. They are spiritual. We're all spiritual. We're recognition- all spirit. I'm sorry. How does that spiritual, I mean, that mirror recognition uh, precursor our spiritual life? I'm not sure I grasp that particular concept. Well, <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's an idea of... of uh, of science that if you can conceive of yourself, if you have the identity that you are a self, therefore you can reflect on a higher universe, a God. So uh-huh. uh, that is well, that know, is their that is their know. argument. It's it's a little lame to me, but you know if it works <laughs> for science, let it work. You know. <laughs> well, I love elephants because of their multifaceted personalities. It just oh yes. It, they, they just pull me in, like the uh, story about the man who cared for the elephants when they were small. He was an elephant advocate, yes. and I can't remember the man's name. But uh, when he passed, elephants from everywhere came to mourn his passing. Right. When right. an elephant in a group dies, the group experiences that loss as a group. So how in the world exactly. can you look at these things and say this animal has no soul for heaven's sake? <laughs> I know. Yes, yes, it's true. I I actually wrote an article about elephants and they're, you know, I, what I don't like is when we anthropomorphize animals. They are not mm-hmm. like humans. We share many of the same characteristics, but they are not like us. We every species has their unique genius and I talk about that in the book too but but there are things we share in common you know and um, uh, you know for example our dogs and cats they have the same neurotransmitters we do the same neurohormones at the same uh, parts of our brains why should they not feel why should they not feel emotion why should they not be like us in those ways <clears throat> elephants who uh, grieve over their their dead and regularly visit the bones um, of their dead? Why should we deny that they have those same uh, parts to them that we do? I completely agree. I like the part about where you were talking about. I can't remember the words you used, and the book is closed, so I I don't I should have labeled the page. But when you're talking about animals who find their human companions when they move, I have actually experienced that. 
And I just, wow. the way you, the way you yes. lay it out, it was like, oh, that's what was going on. My uh, ex-husband's parents had a great big old yellow tomcat, and his name was Jerome, of all things. And he went away. He'd, he'd go out catting around, and he, he'd be gone for days or weeks at a time. And he left about two weeks prior to their moving to a different state. And they had to leave without him because they couldn't wait for him. They didn't have any idea where he was. And he, uh, we were out in the backyard about a month after they had gotten to their new place, and we were all sitting out having lemonade in the backyard. And up walks Jerome, just like he'd always been there. And just flipped yes. it out. But he'd gone across state lines. He'd gone from Virginia to Carolina to find wow. my mom and dad. Th- yes. And these and- stories are wonderful. That is, you know, these stories are wonderful. Um, actually, I have, uh, I was going to bring this up, but I have on my website, lindabender.org, there's a particular section there called um, the Unexplained Powers of Animals. And I, I've done this along with Rupert Sheldrake, and we have a database, actually the only database like it in the world, and we, we collect these stories. Oh. So I'm asking people uh, you know, to add to my treasure trove of, of stories exactly like that. Well, um, over there that would that. be wonderful. Can you, can you submit your story? It's perfect. I certainly would be happy to do that. Yeah. I've had... Um, a few run-ins with wild animals, too, that have changed my life over the years. Uh, when I was living in the country with my ex-husband, we had hummingbirds. And we had two feeders out, and they were quite well attended. And one day I was working in the kitchen, and all of a sudden this little hummingbird's chattering at me through the window. And I went uh-huh. to the window to see what she wanted, and she drew back and flew to the empty feeder and then came back and had a few words with me. And then she right. went back to the feeder. She was letting me know it was empty, so I went out straight away and filled the feeder. And she right. stared back at me like she was saying thank you. I have no idea what she was saying, but I assumed <laughs> it might be something like, oh, silly human, thank you. Gratitude. Finally, yeah. And so uh, she fed very well. And when the husband came home, I told him about it, and he told me that I didn't know what I was talking about. So because I am the right. wonderful person that I am, I let the feeder run empty one day while he was home. And he and I were in the front yard, and the bird came over the roof and got between us and expressed her dismay to me again. And he said, what was that all about? And I said, well, the feeder's empty. He said, how can you possibly know uh-huh. that? I said, because I planned it that way. And uh, so then I said to the bird, what do you want? And she went up to the rooftop and turned around and looked at me, and I did a shrug like I can't fly. So she came down in front of me and led me to the end of the house. And Uh she turned the corner, and I stopped. She came back and got me. She must have thought I was the dimmest thing on the planet. And she walked me to the feeder. (laughs) <laughs> Any time I'd stop, she'd come back and get me. When I got there, the feeder was empty. Well, he's a believer now, and the feeder never went empty again. But they Good do for communicate. you. They do communicate. Of course. And yes, one, of course. And we, you know, we misguidedly think because they don't speak English, you know, <laughs> that, um, that that they're not capable of all this. Well, they actually communicate quite well without the necessity of words most of the time and and you know often words can get get in the way as we know with our dogs and cats yeah the other thing was i was driving across country and in the at sunrise i found myself in the middle of the desert as the sun was coming up over the horizon and i saw movement out of my peripheral vision to my left and i stopped and looked i was the only car on the road and a beautiful mountain lion was just kind of loping across the desert. And when she got to the road, she was right in front of me. She stopped. And she and I sat there looking into each other's eyes for many minutes. And oh. I guess maybe she satisfied her curiosity, and then she went on her way. But any time I feel isolated, I call that up in my memory. And the connection with this beautiful animal was so strong. I have no idea why it happened other than... It was a huge blessing to me. I didn't get yes. any information from her that I'm aware of, but it's 
it's a it's a place that I go when I need to reconnect. Oh, and I think you were given. Um, I think what you were given is the gift of experiencing the power of presence. Mm-hmm. The power That's of sure, presence. Because I was right in that moment. There was nothing else yes. on the planet but the sun coming up because it was just so beautiful. Right. And this right. gorgeous creature. Right. And as so I was I reading your book, that all that was, yeah. events came flooding yeah. back to me. I'd kind of, you know, forgotten about them. So thank you for that. <laughs> right. And so that's wonderful. And and there's there is a there's stories in there about the power of presence and how animals taught me about that. And it's true not only in those precious moments when you know we're caught by that in the middle of our day, but it, it's also true when, for example, well, people say this to me often. You know, I was so I felt so helpless. There was an animal, or my animal, or uh, my pet, or an animal out in the wild that that was dying and uh, was hurt by the roadside and they died, but all I could do is just be there. Mm -hmm. I felt so powerless and so helpless. And what animals have taught me is that it was a very powerful thing that you were there and that the presence is immensely important and to be with another being uh, of whatever species when they're crossing from this life on to another is huge to be there an animal to be there you. in your presence and having yeah. an animal with you when you are experienced the passing of someone i was very fortunate to have this occur when my mother died my longtime listeners probably heard this story and it moved me so much i actually wrote a song about it and um, my mother's little dog came and got me and brought me into her room and the spiritual activity in the room was intense. And mm -hmm. the, the little dog was just all all beside herself. She wanted to get on the bed with Mother. And she kept looking at me like, what's going on? What's all this, what's all this noise going on? And you could actually hear the spiritual activity in the room. So the dog and I sat there mm. and discussed this all night long as we watched the uh, spirits or the angels or whatever you want to call them to come in and take Mom home. And after mm -hmm. after they had left, I let the dog get on the bed with her, and uh, she snuggled up to her as close as she could get. And then she wouldn't leave me, and I guess it's because maybe I smell like mother uh, or looked yes. like her or felt like her. And uh, <clears throat> that was a real bonding experience for me and this little uh, dog. Mm. That's so beautiful. It was. It was one of the yes. highlights of my life. As sad as I was to lose my mother, the blessing of that particular event and all of its spiritual connections, both with the animals and with the people and with whatever else was going on, was just amazing. I will, I will never forget that. Yes, yes. And it's, it's, it's in moments like that that we really, really get it, that there is no division anywhere between anything that's going on in this in this world in this universe and uh it's the the precious moments and and in that reminder that that there's transience too in this life it makes knowing that makes every moment more precious mm -hmm. and that was a beautiful experience yes it was. It was incredible. Very beautiful. You were talking about communicating with the animals without having to speak to them, at them, with them. Do you have any pointers for those of us who really would like to do this on a regular basis? Oh, yes. Well, actually, I have a whole chapter in the book on very, very simple techniques that people can use to, to, to reconnect because, you know, what makes us – what makes us uh, like a GPS and makes us telepathically irresistible to all beings, you know, be it animals or other humans, is the connection we make initially to our own hearts. And it's through the heart and the soul that we connect. And so what we need to do first is get out of our heads, <laughs> you know, <laughs> close down or shut up. <laughs> And focus not on what we're thinking, but who we are being. And that's, 
you know, simply closing our eyes and going inward. The beauty and, is the simplicity of what you just yeah. said. Stop what we're thinking and connect with who we are being. That's that's incredibly simple and profound. It is simple. And you know, we tend I'm to gonna, make I'm it get a lot harder. Of email about that. I'm going to get a lot of email about how do you do that? But uh, one of the things that I have discovered just recently is if you decide to do something and tell the universe that's what you would like to do, they will make it happen. Right. That's the, the, the power of intention. But I think the bottom line is we distort. You know, we have, we pray and we wish for, you know, stuff, mm-hmm. uh, you know, prayers of petition and all that. And so we've, we're misguided a bit um, in how to pray, how to reconnect. So rather than asking for what I have experienced and learned in my own life and what animals have taught me, that it's more effective if we simply open ourselves and announce our presence. I am here. You know, I am here, Lord or animal, whoever we are wanting to connect with, the cosmic, the cosmic sacred universe. I am here. I am open to receiving. And that's, that's when we become powerful beings. And I believe that what we do is we end up receiving what we actually believe in the first place, in the deepest recesses of who we are. And I know that happens a lot with relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, romantic relationships um, turn up you know who turns up what the one who turns up is often what we believe we deserve right um so if we believe that we are that we respect ourselves that we care for ourselves uh we are nourishing our hearts and our souls then then that comes up in our life too you know the the reflection of who we think we are and what we're opening to is what shows up in our lives and that's true with animals too you know think about it you know we ask so much for stuff and you know but the universe isn't giving uh sodi beta backs and and iPhones to nature or birds or you know <laughs> And why would we get they what we want need them <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> i would i would so we need to rethink sit, I would much rather sit in the woods and listen to the birds and watch the animals go by than be plugged into any of that stuff, says the woman who has an online t v a radio show <laughs> well, but you know we still live in this world you know we we sure, yes. uh you know what the Buddhists would say you know uh, we can be we can be completely evolved and all that, but we still, as they say, have to walk the marketplace. You know, we we have to live in this world, you know. I don't necessarily want to do all the technology stuff I have to do, but guess what? (laughs) I have to do it. It's it's part of what we need to do. My newest friend that I'm uh, cultivating a relationship with is a big bumblebee who stays out on our front porch. And he likes to get right in your face and just really examine you. And my husband was trying to take a picture of him. He'd get as close to the camera as he could, like he was trying to figure out what in the world this thing was in front of this guy's face. <laughs> and we spent the best time with this bumblebee because he's very friendly. He's very, um, I imagine he's pretty chatty if I could zero in on his little um, thought process, which I'm working on. Yeah. And I just enjoy yeah. sitting out communing with the bumblebee because he's, He'll come to you, and he's almost landed in my hand a couple of times. <laughs> wow, that's yes, and there's trust there. You see, you're you're putting out the energy of friendship, and and oh hi, I'm you know I'm just another being out here. You know, mm-hmm. um, what happens is sometimes if we put out the energy because we're all energy and um, and information, and we send out real frequencies. And if we're sending out the vibes of fear and, oh, my God, it, if it's a snake, oh, my God, it's going to bite me. I'm terrified, you know. <laughs> Animals well, pick up on what we're sending out. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So, and they respond accordingly. Um, the Native Americans used to say that when they would cross um, a rattlesnake out west, and they would not be fearful. They would just cross paths and oh, recognize another being, and so the snake would would just go about its business. And as opposed to when the the settlers would come and they would encounter a, the same snake, and they would be riddled with fear and terror, and so the snake would react by coiling up and think this is an enemy. Yeah, so it's, again, I, I, it's what we're putting out. We camp a lot, and people will have uh, wasps or hornets or something come up, and they're rather, uh, I'm going to say prickly animals. They they have an energy yes. that will, be, will put you off, especially if you're sensitive to that. And if I can maintain my calm and my peace, they lose interest in me really quickly, which just suits me fine. Right. But then you And they move on. Yes. Yeah. And that and the other campers are just losing their minds. Ah oh wow, well, he's gonna stay. Yeah. Me. Yeah. And so he and he gravitates to that. And so I right. agree with what you just said completely because I've seen it in action so many times. Right, exactly. Right. And the animal responds with, Uh oh, I have to defend myself. Right, yeah. From this negative energy that's coming at me. It's 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 not my opinion, it's just what is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, my husband mm. uh taught me this a long long time ago. A dog can come up to him and the dog's acting a little aggressive and growly and trying to stay behind him. He'll turn around and face the dog. And he'll start talking pleasantly to the dog. And the right. dog ends up just about in his lap. And a right. lot of times the owner will say, gosh, I've never seen him react like that to a stranger before. But I think it's what well, we've been talking about, that, yes. that energy of exactly. peace and acceptance and I'm not going to bite you so you don't bite me kind of thing. <laughs> right. We're of, just two you know, beings okay. bumping into each other. Yeah. 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 So how many animals have you dealt with in your lifetime? I'm, I'm sure you don't have a number. Oh, but my. <laughs> Um, well, we need a long, a, a much longer conversation <laughs> for, for that. But you know, of course, I started out in my backyard with little creatures that seemed to find their way to my door, and um, so you know, the typical. I grew up in New Jersey, uh, but I had a woods in the back. There was an apple orchard, and I was a skinny, scrawny little thing. My dad called me the nature girl. He he got me. He understood. But I was more comfortable out with, you know, the the animals in nature than I was actually indoor with the humans. I was um, so on, on some level I imprinted with them, and you know, on on uh, on the internet we see all these these things about stories about uh, animals and interspecies adoption, and I feel on some on some level I was an interspecies adoption. You know, <laughs> the, the animals saw me as this little thing that needed some nurturing, <laughs> but seeking some love and attachment, and they they invited me into their world, and that was the beginning of a relationship with animals and nature that has never stopped. You know, that's my reality, and I it gets it ever deepens. I envy that. It sounds absolutely wonderful. Um, can you tell us a story or two about some of the animals that you've connected with and worked with over the years? I know you've lived all over the place, and you've had a multitude of them around you. Sure. Um, wow. That I don't know where to begin. <laughs> oh, just um <laughs> Well, I like, and, and I think for the benefit of, of, of the people listening, I think that probably a story that wraps it all up is, is the story that re- opens my book. And it was, it's when I was a very young girl, and it, it, it was one of the most powerful stories in my life. And um, I couldn't really remember a time before I was connected to animals, but I was asked. And I thought back to, well, I guess I was maybe six, I don't know. But I was awakened in the middle of the night, and uh, it was, must have been about two or three in the morning by this, what sounded like non-human screaming. 
oh. outdoors. So I got my parents, woke them up, and we got a flashlight, and we went outdoors. And up on the second tier of of the lawn was this little little heap of fur, and uh, it was a tiny bunny. And mom wasn't around, and this little thing had obviously had some sort of um, near-death experience with a bigger creature. And so I scooped up that little bunny and brought her inside and said to my parents, I'm going to stay all up all night, this little bunny, this little bunny that was just quivering in terror. So I did, and I, I, I lay down on my parents' kitchen floor. And, of course, I did fall asleep, but it was a moment in my life when I distinctly remembered as I held that little bunny up to my heart, and it could... It could feel my heartbeat and my my breathing. And there was a sudden recognition of the interconnectedness of all and that this little being somehow made sense of my being, uh, maybe understand the purpose of my life and that loving and helping creatures was who I was and gave meaning to my hands. And it was a swirling of love and knowing that there was definitely more going on than just who we were in these little bodies. And that truly love was the force that ran the universe and uh, uh, was running the show. And it gave a meaning and purpose to who I was that I hadn't felt before. And it was a beautiful, beautiful encounter that, has again um, really was the beginning of all my relationships with animals. I know what you mean about that love connection that you make with an animal. <clears throat> and again, back to the night my mother passed away, as I sat there holding this little dog, we had a connection on levels that I didn't even realize we could have connections on. Yes. And I. I imagine that's kind of how it felt with you and the bunny. Um, one of the other stories that you told was about your uh, your horse, Shatem. I thought that was awesome, <laughs> especially the way it helped you through that, let's say, scary time. Oh, <laughs> yes, exactly. And, you know, I've been, again, I th- I believe it's thanks to the animals. When I was a little kid out in nature, I believe that I learned to meditate because that was what happened when I would go would be invited into their world you know I would just sort of uh, go into connection with them and it was like a meditation but so I've been a lifelong meditator you know in the beginning I didn't know what I was doing I had no words for it um, I didn't start quote officially meditating till I was in my 20s but I guess I always was but what what I have experienced in my life is that Meditation is like number one thing we need to do to connect animals to ourselves, to begin this whole process um, Mm -hmm. that people want more of. But often, meditation isn't always where we have our greatest experiences. Meditation adds to it, and it promotes it. But And that's what happened to me out in the riding in the bush in in Africa with my horse, Shatem. We were out one day riding in in the bush, as we did most days, in the afternoons and one day was just amazingly beautiful and I became at a loss to where I was ending and Jetem began and everything else began and everything ended and um, it was a beautiful moment of oneness that happened while I was out living my normal day and it did come back to me in a moment when my life was threatened years later. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. As you know. So I believe what's most important to do in this lifetime is to reconnect with who we are as as uh guided by our hearts and that we are really all souls and to live in that knowingness that we are souls is what we need to be doing more of. I mean, m- many people believe that animals have souls. They believe it is something to think about. Other people um, maybe take it another step further and think, well, maybe it's a possibility. 
But I actually live that. It's part of my life. I live that. I don't have to believe in it or have faith in it. It is who I am and how I live every day. And it continues to get deeper and deeper, as it does with anybody who is willing to dive in and begin the process. Well, I have to agree with you about the soul connection. I cannot fathom any living thing, even a rock, because they are living things. And people look at me and roll their eyes. But if you work with them, you no, know, no, you know, I, I agree. Know what I'm about. Um, <clears throat> everything has a soul to it, and if that's what you look for, that's what you're going to see. If that's what you intend yes. to connect with, that's where that connection is going to be. I read um, James Redfield's uh, Celestine prophecies many years ago, and he advocated that every everybody was a soul and it was light to light. So I got up one morning and I said, okay, uh, universe, I would like to connect soul to soul with everyone I see today. I don't want to see the outside. I want to see that soul light. And lo and behold, and this goes back to what I was saying, <laughs> tell the universe have happened, have happened, and chances are it will. If you want to do, you want to do that, just let the universe know you're open to that and it will happen. And I got in my car and I set off down the road and all of a sudden, I realized that I wasn't seeing anybody on the road. All I was seeing was lights. Lights were driving cars. Lights were walking down the street. Some lights were really bright white. Some were kind of dimmer. Some were blue. Some were gold. All different color lights. And as I got used to seeing the world that way <clears throat> and stopped going, oh, my goodness, and not driving up a tree somewhere, I started to wonder what right. the animals looked like. And unfortunately, I didn't see any animals. But I would mm. imagine that it would have looked very similar to what I was seeing in humans. And oh, yes. One of those, that was one of those, I call them uh, inside glimpses that you get when you're right in the exact moment of now and you're connected yes. to, that, to that being that runs through everybody. It was just incredible. And I tell people about it and uh -huh. they kind of look at me sideways, but I know what happened. <laughs> Sure, you know, and, and that's your truth, and you know that, and you need to believe and know that that is your truth. Yeah. So I'm getting everything that you're saying about this this heart-to-heart, -heart, this, soul, this soul connection. And when we stop mm -hmm. living in our, in our mind, not our mind, in our brain, I guess, I guess it would be mine. We try to think everything through and figure yes. it out. And just let it be. Just allow, and my longtime listeners know my fondness for that word, just allow things to be who and what they are. And this connection yes. I'm talking about will happen a whole lot easier than if you try to force it, yeah? Exactly, right. It's it's We try so hard to push the river, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we get in our own too. way. <laughs> we do ah, that. yeah. We do get in our own way. And it's that trying to make sense out of things that don't have to make sense. You know, we're, we're yes. brought up to have yeah. pie charts and graphs and everything has to be proven scientifically. But, you know, there's a faith right. out there, and that faith that lets you just be part of what it is. Right, right. And, you know, I, I think we waste a lot of energy on the debate between science mm -hmm. and spirituality. I mean, I love science. I'm trained in science. Mm -hmm. And I'm a lifelong, uh, been on a lifelong mystical path. But I personally have never felt the conflict between science and spirit. You know, I, and so for me, I think, why are we wasting so much energy on the debate when, in fact, it's not about that debate. It's about, mm -hmm. it's about understanding that science is one part and spirit is another part but it's all it's part all um whole. it's all part of the whole my mother used mm -hmm. to say that um certain individual in the family was kind of ornery and i said what do you mean she said well he'll argue with the post and pull it up and then argue with the whole and i think that's kind of what we do when we get on these big tangents about spirituality versus science and all that sort of thing and, uh, again, uh -huh. let it be what it is. There is no conflict. It all works quite well together, and it doesn't take us to have to figure it out for it to do that, right? Right. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, our brains can only figure so much out, you know, and and truth, truth and what we know is always 
um, you know, replaced by what we know tomorrow and what comes mm-hmm. up next. So we, we have to remember that uh, science is always renewing itself. You know, our, our spiritual journeys are always renewing themselves. Change is part of life as, mm-hmm. you know, dark and light, you know, life and death. We, we can't have one without the other, yin and yang. It all goes together. Mm-hmm. And it was made to do that. <laughs> Right. We we weren't stuck here to figure it out and stick our fingers in it and change it. Yes, yeah. I have a whole chapter on, on living in mystery, and animals are wonderful tutors in that, you know. I would imagine um, that We don't have are. to figure everything out. I love what you said about them not knowing what's coming or caring what's coming. They're They're always in the now. They don't remember yesterday unless something horribly traumatic happened. I know that animals are abused all the time. And they do remember that. Right. And I can understand. Yes, of course. But they aren't concerned about what's going to happen. They're just doing what they're doing right now. Right. And they trust. You know, they Mm -hmm. have a trust. And and I like to think of it as, you know, animals trust because they exist in a place that is more connected to whatever you want to call it, the universe, the cosmos, God. They're in that. They're in that. They live in that space. And so, although, don't get me wrong, horrible things happen in their lives, things that are just shockingly horrendous to us, but they still have a basic trust in life and trust in all. And so they worry less about uh, what's going to happen after we die or what's going to happen tomorrow because there's this sort of innate trust in the oneness of source. And I use source a lot in my book is the word you know they trust source it may not always be that great things are happening but they trust in in source itself right that I, if uh, what's happening today is reasonably okay then probably what happens tomorrow will be reasonably okay too <laughs> i was doing research for my um my self-help program that i created 20 years ago or so and one of the things that um uh, they were talking about was that, you know what, I just derailed my train of thought. Oh, well, one of the, yeah, this course that you put together. Right. um, As I was going, I was having to dig into metaphysics, which is something that usually scared the, the pants off of me. But I found it fascinating because once you start digging into these, these, um, meta particles, these little tiny pieces of physics, you see this huge pattern that you didn't see before. And it is right. all connected and it does all go together and you don't have to rearrange it and you don't have to change it. You just have to go with that flow and be in that right. moment. Right. And here's that allow word again. Allow it to be what it right. is and and not be concerned. Oh, I I just remembered my point. Um one of the things that I learned is that more Americans die at nine o'clock on Monday morning. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, that's odd. Why is that? And the next sentence cleared it up because they're stressed out about going to work. I've never seen an animal no. have a heart attack at nine o'clock on Monday morning because he was worried about his job. No. <laughs> he's just doing what he's here to do. He the lions are doing their lion things, and the birds are doing their bird things, and the crocodiles are doing right. their crocodile things, and they're not concerned with the rest of the world. And right. I, I honestly right. believe if humans were a little bit more like that, we wouldn't be quite as sick as we are. I completely agree with you. Totally, totally. And, you know, one thing that this debate with new science and all that, and I actually have a son who's a, a budding physicist, so we get into these, these dialogues uh frequently but you know we have to be careful what we extrapolate from from physics um proving spirituality or disproving whatever and and i think that dogmatic science you know the newtonian way of science that has held uh, us in a grip for so long that we can figure everything out that basically science knows everything science knows the big deal um but we just need to fill in these details. And I think one of the most important lessons that we've learned from the, the quantum uh, physics 
stuff is that maybe we don't know that we're not so smart that we can go back to a little bit of humility mm-hmm. uh, and say there's a whole lot out there we don't know one of the things that i live and i think it's is- very healthy is that adage that when you think you know it all, you stop learning about whatever it is you think you know all about? And I try exactly. diligently not to do that. I never assume that I know yep. everything. I'm always right. looking for that next lesson. I'm always looking to learn something new. Right. And right. that's kind of yes. my driving force most of the time. <laughs> Yes, and I think that, that, you know, part of our human genius, I talk about every species has a, a species-specific genius for something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as humans, we're thinkers. You know, we love to problem solve. You know, we love to ask the existential questions. We like to solve problems. We want to know. And that's part of, of, of the wonder of who we are. doesn't mean we always come up with the answers, but we enjoy sometimes living the questions, which is probably the best thing to do. But, you know, we are able to come up with creative solutions to problems and implement them. That's why we can be so helpful to animals now in light of all the problems that are in the world. But we put ourselves out there and and we're able to do it. But as Kierkegaard said, that there comes a point in all your learning and all you've strived and worked hard to know is that you reach like a, a turning point when you realize that you cannot know everything, that there are things that are unknown and then you become okay. comfortable in that. And it's and it's okay. beautiful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to know everything. I think I would be bored out of my mind if I knew everything. Wouldn't we be bored, you I know, if our genius would. is to solve problems? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, I've always said that you can lead someone to wisdom, but you can't make them think. And right. Sometimes you just you can't confuse yourself with facts if your mind's already made up. But if you're open minded and you can let go of what you think is the truth and and cast around for what you're seeing or what's coming at you, you might find out that um there are more truths out there than are in your oh, I have that go, um oh shoot, I can't recall that but Shakespeare. More things in heaven There's than earth more. are in your Yes, 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 than you could ever imagine. Yes, yeah, there's more going on out there. That's it, yeah. (laughs) Right, there is so much more. And isn't that wonderful? I think that's absolutely wonderful. It is. Yeah. Well, I'm still taken by the fact that we can communicate without words. And I think Mm. that if people would learn to do that with people, and I'm not talking about sign language or anything like that. I'm talking about that innate um, psychic connection. And I use the word psychic advisedly because I know some people bristle at that. But it's that mind-to-mind, soul-to-soul connection that <coughs> we have with yes. you know, some people and with animals. If we would learn to do that on a regular basis, I think a lot of the conflict in the world would dissolve. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely, I totally agree. Most of my, most all of my connections with animals, my whole life have been about meaning and purpose, and and things that often go beyond the necessity of words. And I think that um, you know we're all animals, and we all communicate. And I sometimes get in trouble with animal communicators because I think, well, we all do it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all animals and we all communicate. But these people say to me, well, you know, what does Fluffy want for dinner? I say, I don't do what Fluffy wants for dinner, but <laughs> I could probably teach you how to figure that out, but it's not what I do. Communications are more of, uh, you know, heart and soul, meaning and purpose. And really, um, rarely did I even require words uh, until, you know, I needed to put things down. It was very, very difficult to write a book when How you're well talking about the heart and, you know, to try to translate all that stuff into words, you know, was exhausting. I, I got that handed to me. I was working with my higher guidance 
they were giving me what they call spoken symbols to help heal the planet and different places on the planet. And I said, well, what does this mean? I kept asking them, what does this mean? They were giving me these mm. strange-sounding syllables, syllables that had no connection in my mind with anything. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, just, just feel what we're telling you. And so I did, and I started getting pictures in my mind of what they were talking about. And I said, well, I need yes. to communicate this to other people. You want me to tell people about this. How do I do that? And they said, well, what do you want us to do? And I said, I need words. I need human words. And they, they said, you mean clumsy human words? And I said, yes, exactly. So Exactly. I get that because when I communicate with spirit, I get the feelings, I get the pictures in my heart and in my mind, but there aren't any words there. Right, right. Really we're lacking. Uh, yeah. And it's, yeah, we're it's lacking in happen. words to a lot for a lot of it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Our time. And I teach people that. You know, I teach people that. I say, you know, when you're. You have to remember when you're trying to connect with another being and um, say an animal or or whatever, you know, you have to realize that they're not speaking English. They're not they're not reading books. They're not reading Shakespeare. You know <laughs> you will get the meaning and the purpose, but the words come from you. The words are what you assign. Mm-hmm. And what you know, we need to keep that keep that understanding and it, it, and it it it's helpful you know um it's helpful to remember that well our time has come to a close uh linda and i'm just so thrilled to have had you on the show i really appreciate everything you've said and i love your book if you guys get the chance to find her book and read it i'll have all that information on the show uh link when you read it uh when when i get it posted but it's Animal Wisdom, Learning from the Spiritual Lives of Animals by uh, Linda Bender, DVM. It's on Amazon, and you can click on it from my website, lindabender.org. Good to know, good to know. And um, the link, I think, will be in, in what I'm going to put up, too. It's a wonderful book, and if you even think you even like animals just a little bit, you're going to want to read this book because it will change your whole paradigm about animals and your connection to spirit and everything so i want to thank you so much for joining me on the show if you'd like to send me a question or a suggestion for a topic that you'd like for me to cover on the show please send your question suggestion or request to me at chessie at chessieroberts.com and you can find all of my information at chessieroberts.com My music is at archersmeadow.com, and I've written several songs that actually cover some of the things we've talked about today. So you might have fun going to archersmeadow.com and uh, giving them a listen and maybe even purchase them and make them your own. And my book is on Amazon.com, Chessie Roberts and Chessie Roberts, and I'll pop right up. So thank you for listening, and come back anytime to hear Get on the Group with Chessie Roberts. Have a great time until I see you again. Bright blessings. Bye-bye. 